Good evening everyone. My name is Rory Branagh and I am the co-chair of the Daniel Mannix Lecture Committee alongside Joseph Freeman. Thank you for your attendance this evening. I'd like to now welcome the Students Club President, Kimika, to begin the lecture. Association, 
Dr. Darcy McCormick, Principal of St Mary's College, and Mr. Peter McMullen, AM. All of you, however, are special guests here this evening, and I'm very grateful to all of you for coming to enjoy this lecture. Archbishop, Archbishop Mannix was one of Australia's greatest ever public speakers, so no pressure tonight. <laughs> I hope I can do him justice. Like the Archbishop, I was raised firmly within the arms of the Catholic Church. My parents were devout believers who migrated to Australia from Slovenia after World War II, in part because they worried that they wouldn't be able to practice their religion freely in communist Yugoslavia. Religious freedom was important to them, so important that they crossed the world to find it. Like many of you, I'm sure that my youth was marked by the checkpoints and rituals of the church. I did my first communion and my confirmation at St Joseph's at Como. I went to Mass on Sundays. I went to confession every Saturday, although I struggled to really think of any sins to confess as a nine-year-old. <laughs> Usually I was fighting with my brothers, uh, and for that I'd get a pretty, pretty mild three Hail Marys. When you're a kid, none of that feels very noteworthy. It just feels normal. But as I've got an older, I've reflected more on how these experiences have shaped me as a person, on how the church's teachings guided me, on how they've coloured my basic sense of right and wrong. There's no doubt in my mind that growing up Catholic has influenced my politics, as it has for so many in the Labor Party and in the Labor movement and not just in the obvious ways that history has recorded. So I'm not going to talk about B.A. Santa Maria tonight or the Catholic Social Studies movement he set up with Archbishop Mannix's support. Although Kevin might want to talk about that at a future <laughs> <laughs> But before that and since, the links between the Catholic Church and Labour have been enduring and unshakable. I'm talking about something harder to pin down, but no less important in shaping our direction as a nation. I want to speak tonight about the essential role that values play in political leadership. Good political leadership requires making your values clear as much as it requires laying out your plans for practical action. It's about answering the why as well as the how of what you're fighting for. Too often progressive political parties jump straight to how we want to make the world better. We assume that people understand our reasons for pursuing the changes that we're fighting for and sometimes we miss the opportunity of finding common ground and persuading people. In the modern world our values come from many different places. There's no longer a single pulpit or a universal source of truth. Secular philosophy and religious faith live side by side, largely in peace. But it's clear to me that even in our fractured world, the timeless lessons of Christ continue to inform progressive politics and progressive political parties. Love thy neighbour, turn the other cheek. The first will be the last and the last will be the first. The meek shall inherit the earth. These are really simple statements, but that shouldn't hide just how radical they are. If we take it seriously, Jesus's message was incredibly demanding. Have you ever tried to love your neighbours? <laughs> All of your neighbours? The call to universal love will always be profoundly difficult, whoever we are, but it's especially challenging in our polarised world. A world where disinformation is weaponised, where culture wars are stoked, where cynical actors try and divide us for political gain, where empathy and love are equated by some with weakness. It's much harder to love your neighbour when the internet is spreading lies about them. They're out to take your job, they're going to crowd your cities, even threaten your safety. Or when a talking head tells you that your political opponent is actually your personal enemy. As politicians, too often we seek to be understood rather than to understand, to be seen rather than to see. And I think this is part of the reason that almost a quarter of Australians voted for minor parties and independents 
in the last election. In part, it's because they don't feel like major parties are listening to them or that we share their values. They feel that we don't understand or see them. It's pretty hard to identify a single political achievement of One Nation or Clive Palmer. And beyond freedom, 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 <laughs> it's difficult to identify what a Prime Minister, Craig Kelly, would do in office. <laughs> But people aren't voting for him because of detailed programmatic specificity, <laughs> as Kevin would have it. It's more the vibe that Dennis Denuto describes. The so-called teal independents are running on climate and integrity. And until the Liberals and Nationals act on these issues, otherwise conservative voters will look to independents who will. Leaders must address the underlying economic insecurity and other frustrations that drive people into the arms of minor parties and independents. And we need to offer them something more hopeful instead. The role of leaders in Australia should be to strengthen what binds us together as a nation. Not to ignore division or difference, but to remind us that the values we share like our belief in democracy, our faith in the rule of law, and our commitment to essential rights and liberties. And, if, and it's the role of leaders to show that where the differences do exist, they can be managed civilly. This is only possible where we strive in good faith to empathise with each other, to see each other as the full and complex human beings we are. And despite some who try to tell us otherwise, empathy isn't soft, it's not weakness, it's a superpower. This is where the lessons of Christianity can teach us so much because the call for universal love was truly an earth-shaking idea. Think of the world that Jesus was born into. With the Roman occupation of Jerusalem, the greatest empire the planet had ever seen, it was a brutal, unforgiving world where dominance was admired, where violence ruled, where power and might governed all. And into this world came a man from Nazareth, a humble village near the shores of Galilee, who turned that moral universe on its head. A man who spoke to common people in the common tongue, who tended to lepers, who defended prostitutes, who told the rich to share their possessions with the poor. These words must have exploded like a bomb across ancient Judea. Because in the classical world, the meek were not revered, they were despised. The peacemakers weren't blessed, they were conquered and enslaved. If the word revolutionary has any meaning at all, the Sermon on the Mount was revolutionary. We know it appealed to the people on the margins, to the farmers and the tradesmen pushed aside by Roman elites. We know that it scared the powerful. In fact, the message was so challenging, so feared by Roman authorities, so threatening to the rulers of the temple that Jesus was crucified. A slow and agonising and humiliating death. For Romans, nothing was more shameful than the cross. But like so much else, the early Christians flipped this idea on its head as well. For Jesus, it wasn't humiliating to suffer and die like a criminal. It wasn't a disgrace to be brought down low. In death as in life, Jesus overturned the moral order just as he overturned the money-lending tables he found in the temple. Of course, for Christians, there's more to Jesus' life than moral teaching. There's what happened in the days after his death, the central mystery of the Christian religion. The resurrection is not something we can prove or disprove. It can only be arrived at by faith or rejected by scepticism. But what we do know is that for countless people since, the life of Jesus has offered a beacon of practical inspiration. To do good work, 
to help our fellow human, to live out faith, to live our values through action. Of course, the Catholic Church hasn't always lived up to these standards. It hasn't always embraced its message of universal love or empathised with those on the margins. In fact, sometimes it has betrayed them unforgivably. But I still find inspiration in the ordinary people of faith, the nuns and the brothers and lay people who live out their love every day, who love fiercely, practically and without judgment. When my husband was struggling to get clean from his heroin addiction, it was the Salvation Army that took him in and gave him the support he needed to change his life. When the New South Wales Drug Summit proposed a medically supervised injecting centre so drug users could reduce their risk of overdose and access rehab services, it was the nuns at St Vincent's Hospital in my electorate who were the first <coughs> to volunteer to set it up. People in aged care facilities, homelessness services, hospitals, advocates for refugees, for prisoners, for exploited workers and trafficked women. These Australians are on the front line of justice. They are taking in the sick and the hurt and the lonely. And they are not just engaged in individual acts of charity either. They are advocates work, working for and fighting for a fairer world. Now, not all of them are driven by religious faith, but each of them to a person is driven by a powerful set of values and they're living those values in the world. Now, newsflash, politics is not always a saintly profession, <laughs> but I have always been drawn to people who live their values openly and I've tried to learn from them too. Because it's clear to me that belief and practical action are not in opposition, they are the why and the how of our lives of leadership. I think sometimes in the Labor Party, we forget that good leadership in includes explaining our values and using them to persuade. We tend to rush towards the how because we assume that people understand our why. We think they already know what we're about or why we're proposing a set of detailed policies. We think that they will extrapolate our values from our actions, but the truth is, that people make sense of the world through values and through stories before they ever get their heads around our plans or our policy details. Too often, and I say this particularly about the last election campaign, we go straight to the how. How we will fight climate change, how we will increase wages, how, how we will improve schools and hospitals. And our instinct really should be to start with the why. Why does it matter to us? Why should it matter to voters? Sometimes those values, that motivation, comes from life experience. Like Kevin Rudd sleeping in his car after his dad's death. Like Julia Gillard seeing her clever, hard-working parents miss out on an education. Or Anthony Albanese looking after his mum on a disability support pension. But for, for others, for many others <coughs> in the Labor Party, that motivation is faith, like the long line of social justice Catholics who have shaped our party over generations. This lecture is in honour of Archbishop Daniel Mannix, one of the founders of Newman College and perhaps Australia's most significant churchman. Daniel Mannix lived for 99 eventful years, 46 of them as the Archbishop of Melbourne. And for most of that time, he was an active voice in public debate. Active and, if we're being honest, controversial. If anyone lived their faith, lived their values in the world, the Archbishop did. As one of his biographers put it, quote, his long life has no parallel in Australian history. No political leader, no matter how persistent, durable or charismatic, commanded the stage in the end as Mannix did. From all reports, he enjoyed the stage and he commanded it well. Mannix's Australian story began in 1912 at the age of 48 when he arrived in a boat from Ireland and was sent to St Mary's in North Melbourne. 
This was his first experience as a parish priest and it radicalised him. North Melbourne was a parish of the displaced with Irish immigrants in the 19th century and Italian immigrants in the 20th. In this tight-knit community, Mannix was confronted with poverty and despair. He tended to families in slum housing, to parents without work, to kids without shoes. And to his great credit, Daniel Mannix never accepted these injustices as natural. They made him angry and they made him act. Mannix's faith, his values, were bound up in the fight for a better world. And it was a practical, everyday fight. As the Archbishop of Melbourne, Mannix supported the Seaman strike of 1919. He told the strikers, many of whom were his parishioners, the sooner people realise that the worker must get not merely a living wage, but a fair share of the wealth he produces, the better. The sooner people realise that men and women and children count for more than property, the better it will be for the community. If Jesus spoke for the underdog, so did Archbishop Mannix. He was a generation ahead of his time on Indigenous justice, calling for reparations as early as 1938. He was one of the world's most prominent supporters of Irish independence. At the peak of World War I, he campaigned against conscription. None of this advocacy was easy. None of it was expected of him. It put a target on his back. He was considered so dangerous that David Lloyd George banned him from Ireland. Billy Hughes once called him a traitor, a quote, a man to whom every German in the country looks. If you follow him, you range yourself under the banner of the deadly enemies of Australia. <laughs> the blows never really stopped from the right or the left, but he continued on because for Daniel Mannix, the spiritual and the practical missions were connected. The why and the how, they informed each other and they enriched each other. Now, Daniel Mannix was one of a kind, and during the Labor split, I couldn't say his role was a good one. There might be others in the audience who disagree. But there's so much that we can learn from his long life because the lessons of religion, of course, can continue to help us solve the problems of today. They are still a powerful force for good. Pope Francis, Pope Francis is a testament to this truth. His papacy has renewed focus on the challenges facing humanity, the biggest challenges, like the future of our environment or the shape of our global economy, or the duties we owe each other as human beings. In the fight against climate change, Pope Francis has been a genuine global leader. In his gentle way, he's been as clear and as urgent as Greta Thunberg. As he wrote in his second encyclical on care for our common home, Quote, climate change is a global problem with grave implications, environmental, social, economic, political. It represents one of the principal challenges facing humanity in our day. And what's more, the responsibility to fix it is a collective one. Pope Francis grounds this advocacy in his Christian faith, in his values. For Francis, creation is God's masterpiece. It's a quote, common good belonging to all and meant for all. It's a book, again quoting, whose letters are the multitude of created things present in the universe. We should stand before it with awe and we should protect it because when environments collapse, it's a disaster for all of humanity, but it is a particular catastrophe for the poor and the vulnerable. The Pope's fight against climate change goes hand in hand with his fight against inequality and with his fight for a fairer economy. This is an old tradition in Catholic social teaching, one that places social justice at the heart of economic decision making, that values the last as much as it values the first. According to Catholic social teaching, human individuals are sacred, made in the image of God, so we owe them the freedom the resources and the opportunities they need to be their true selves. Which means we can't let economic life resemble anarchy. We need to do better than survival of the fittest. As the Pope argues in his most recent encyclical, 
the market quoting again, the marketplace by itself cannot resolve every problem, however much we're asked to believe this dogma of neoliberal faith. He's right. We need more than markets to survive. We need an active state. We need an active civil society, just as we need an active <coughs> private sector. Our economies function much better when they value productive labour over speculation, when they're embedded in our communities and in our social lives. And I want to really say this. This is about justice, not charity. It's about justice, not charity. As the Blessed Frederick Osnard put it, charity is the Samaritan who pours oil on the wounds of the traveller who has been attacked. It is justice's role to prevent the attack. That's what an economy that's built on human dignity looks like. And that's what Pope Francis's message is in the 21st century, just as it was Daniel Mannix's message in the 20th century. Of course, these concepts aren't unique to Christianity. In fact, they're a common feature across most religions. Most religions have a form of the golden rule, treat others as you would have them treat you. The Quran calls on people to be, quote, steadfast in prayer, to practice regular charity, and to bow down your heads with those who bow down. Buddhists and Hindus share the concept of dunna, the need to cultivate generosity in spirit and practice. Sikhs have rampant chakor, the responsibility to share what you have with your community. And if you've seen Australian Sikhs around the country, especially during natural disasters, giving out food to those in need, you would know how seriously the Australian Sikh community takes this responsibility. Faith is deeply personal, but for most people, it's about action in the world too. It's about living by a code of justice and being prepared to fight against injustice wherever you find it. It has to be about more than individual acts of charity though. Our values call on us to be kind, to be gentle, to love our neighbour. But they also demand of us that we fight for systemic change that benefits those most in need. It's about designing an economic system that has justice at its heart and a legal system that protects the vulnerable. As Dom Helder Camara, the Brazilian Archbishop, once observed, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why they're uh, when I ask why there are poor, they call me a communist. <laughs> Economic justice has always been Labor's mission and it's no coincidence that Catholic social teaching has played such an outsized role in our party's history. Economic justice is what we'll be fighting for for the next eight weeks. Those basic, essential, material issues that underpin a decent life like making sure that pay rises with productivity so inflation doesn't eat away people's ability to fill up their car or enrol their kids in soccer on the weekend or buy good nutritious food for their family or pay their mortgage without that constant hum of anxiety. Like making sure that Medicare or the NDIS are there for people when they need those services. Making sure that people can live with respect and dignity in aged care. All of these are necessary for human dignity and for human flourishing. That's what Christ taught his disciples. It's what Pope Francis teaches us today. It's what motivates me, and I know it's what motivates our leader, Anthony Albanese. The fight for economic and social justice is what motivates the next Labor government. These are values that have informed us over generations. It's the role of leaders to be fluent in explaining these values, to translate them to the modern world. If people know that their leaders understand what matters to them, they're more likely to put their faith in us. They're more likely to trust us with their interests. This is one of the many lessons in the life of Daniel Mannix, a man who attracted fierce loyalty from his flock. And it teaches us that when it comes to good political leadership, both the why and the how are critically important. Good policy, and good politics start with good values. If we're clear about the why, the how naturally follows. That's how you build trust, 
That's how you bring people with you. That's how you can change the world for the better. Thank you. Thank you.